Hello, hello. Good morning, everybody. I'm going to wait a couple more seconds here to get everybody logged on, but we're here today to talk about the Biomakers and Region Ag Lab partnership that's coming online this spring. We've had a lot of really amazing questions, a lot of folks really excited about it. I know I am really excited to work with Lance and his team and to have our technology in another lab and more make it more accessible to the Midwest. So just gonna wait a couple more seconds here, get some more folks logged on, and then we'll just jump right in. All right, looks like we've got about 50 people here. So I'm just gonna jump in. These are recorded. So for anyone that comes in late, uh, you can always check it out later and check out, take a listen for everything that we'll be talking about today. So um, we've got Lance here and Gus, and we're gonna to talk today about the beet crop technology in general and some questions that Lance has been getting about bringing biomakers technology into his lab and just talk about the benefits of beet crop, the benefits of putting beet crop and the Haney test together. I'd love to touch on that. Uh, that's kind of Lance's specialty is the, the Haney test. So I think they're really powerful together. Um, so we're really excited to have them both working in his lab. And I know that he's received, a, you know, a handful of questions about logistics and how to collect samples and why it's interesting to us to look at biology. So I'm going to kind of frame things up. I'll ask Lance to introduce the lab here in a minute and talk about Regen and kind of what they, their bread and butter. Um, and then I'll kind of dive into the bee crop technology and why biomakers, I, what I, why I think it's so exciting to look at and why it's a really important concept and, and piece of the puzzle when you're thinking about soil, soil health holistically. Um, so we'll dive into a little bit of that and then we're going to get into the nitty gritty. How do you pull samples? When to pull samples? Uh, how much it costs? Sampling um, submission sheet and all of those things to streamline the process for, you know, on our side, straight coming from the field, make sure everyone's on the same page so that Lance gets off to a great start here in April. So a little bit about biomakers, if you haven't heard of us yet, uh, we're a technology company that is looking at the soil microbiome. So we use DNA sequencing to decode the microbiome, and then we look at the functionality of the different organisms. So we're particularly looking at bacteria and fungi. I'll dive into that a little bit more. But the really, really critical piece here is that we wanted to connect soil biology to agricultural decision making. And we're going to get into why that's important when we look at the you know, full soil health picture. Biology is a really critical component of understanding how soil functions and something that we haven't really had a great way of looking at in the past. Uh, we've looked at chemistry a lot. Um, so that's kind of where Biomakers was founded to take the guesswork out of biology and biological decision making. So um, a lot of good guesses out there, a lot of products that are coming to the market that we have a lot of questions around. And we wanted to take the guesswork out of that and, and bring the technology that already existed into agriculture. And Lance, I'll, I'll let you go ahead and introduce um, Region Ag Labs here really briefly before we dive into the technology and so you got a cat on your lap. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, good morning everybody and thanks for joining us today. Uh, my name is Lance Gunderson. I'm the owner and co-founder of uh, Region Ag Lab. And we focus uh, primarily on working with growers who are either already somewhere down the journey of soil health or are looking to transition into more of a regenerative type growing model. Um, you know, the lab was kind of started in 2019. Uh, I, I've been involved with soil health testing though for about 12 years. I've been involved with soil testing for almost 21 years. And uh, we're located just north of Pleasanton, Nebraska, so right in the center of the country, really small town, um, but uh, got a great team here. And I was really uh, introduced to metagenomics technology probably seven or eight years ago when it was just kind of getting started. Uh, we've kind of held off on, on things for a while because, you know, we wanted that technology to develop. Uh, we wanted the databases to be built, the interpretations to be built, and I think that Biomakers has done a great job doing that, obviously. They've spent a lot of time and a lot of focus uh, on, on doing that and bringing that into the agricultural sector. Uh, little background just on how this relationship came to be. Uh, you know, for the last couple of years, uh, I was working closely with uh, 
uh, someone who was previously uh, at BioMakers, uh, Al Toops, and I, you know, and I worked with him closely. We ran a lot of samples, but what was interesting is that we ran B crop technology uh, through the BioMakers lab and facility, and coupled that with uh, some of the tests that we run, you know, Haney testing and PLFA and those things. And uh, Dr. Rick Haney, who is our chief scientific officer at, at Region Ag Lab, has been diving through those results. We've been getting feedback from growers, looking at things. Uh, and it was really interesting to see how those two things tied together. Uh, and it's not to say that either one of them isn't very useful as a standalone. Uh, they are, but wow, when we really pull these together, uh, we're seeing some pretty amazing things. So we're here today to kind of talk to you a little bit about uh, how we're how we're going to develop this partnership and what it really looks like um, and how we're going to continue to work together to try to get you guys the farmers and and everybody out there that the answers that they're looking for in this biological kind of soil management journey thanks lance awesome to just hear more about the partnership thanks for tying that piece in and uh, really excited to bring all these pieces together um, so before I dive too much further, I, I'm not always great at kind of setting the framework so of the webinar piece of things. I just like to talk about the technology. But a little bit of housekeeping before we go too much further. Um, you can drop questions in the box and please ask questions. We'll have plenty of time for Q&A. You know, we really want this to be interactive and more of a conversation um, compared to some of our webinars that are very content heavy. So please drop questions in the box. I will see them all and mediate the best I can. Um, and again, this will be recorded, so just wanted to say that. So if anyone has questions along the way, they can um, pop them in and we'll get to them as many as we can at the end. So uh, like I kind of went over a little bit, uh, we're going to talk about, what we're going to talk about today is, um, you know, partnership opportunities. That, you know, Lance and I have just talked, he just touched on uh, for really connecting the soil and bio, or the chemistry and biology pieces, um, the differences in different soil testing why we're looking at all of it together and why it's really important in decision making today in agriculture. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the timeline of bringing this technology into Lance's lab and when he'll be receiving samples and then um, you know talk about the technology, how bee crop can help and the benefits of the biological soil testing. So please again drop questions in the box. I'm just going to do a high level overview and Lance um, please hop in and add anything as I go along that comes up for you. Um, yeah, don't 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 hold back. Just so you could interrupt me and um, add add more in. So, I mean, just to kind of talk about like why do we care about this stuff? Why are we getting increasing questions about biology and just kind of what we can do differently and, and soil health in general? I mean, I think there's some pretty obvious um, things that come up for us in our work, anyways, and in the globe, like in the world right now, in food systems, is one increasing input costs. Uh, you know, it's getting more and more expensive to farm and raise a crop. Um, and so there comes to be questions of like, how can we do things differently? And uh, are there opportunities to maintain production while reducing some of these agricultural inputs? And it's, it's my experience and my belief that focusing on soil health can help us achieve that. Um, in addition to the crop loss and loss in the crop quality that we're seeing across the US, I mean, in, in Kansas this year, we had almost 2 million acres of wheat fail. Um, and there's increasing pressure, you know, environmental pressure on, on our cropping systems and soil health, improving soil health can really make us resilient to that, in my experience. So, um, you know, that, that's kind of where I come from and how I think about, you know, why this is such an increasing conversation is because of, you know, these two Two of these issues along with other things but lance i don't know if you have anything to, to add to that in terms of why do we care about soil health right now yeah i mean i think you know you hit the nail on the head it, i mean at the end of the day if we get through all the scientific mumbo jumbo and all the nitty-gritty it comes down to cost and economics right um but important you know this was kind of my little revelation if you will and i'm sure other people have reached this conclusion but uh you know i think if COVID showed me anything it showed me something about supply chain issues right um uh, like we all have experienced doesn't matter what sector you're in i mean everybody's everybody's suffering from supply chain issues and, and increased costs right so 
for me, it was like, okay, in soil testing and in agriculture, we're very good at evaluating the supply. And the supply was what we did with soil tests before, right? What, how much nitrogen is in my soil? How much phosphorus is in my soil? Like we're, we're good at looking at the warehouse. And then we take the plant as a factory and we're good at measuring the output of that plant and that's yield, right? And if we didn't get the yield we expected, then there must be some problem with the supply. And then we go address the supply, which is fertilizer and we put fertilizer on. What we're missing though is how do the goods get from the warehouse to the factory? That's your transport team. And who is the transport team? Well, those are your microbes. We often think plants just take all this stuff right out of the soil, right? We're just feeding the plant. Well, when we fertilize, we're actually feeding the microbes. And then the microbes in turn feed the plant and the plant feeds them. And that's the reaction, the trade. So what we're doing with this is trying to evaluate your transport team and your trade efficiency. You're trying to determine where are the gaps, right? If you are a warehouse manager and you need to get stuff shipped, well, you need the infrastructure, you need soil structure, you need the trucks, you need the roads, you need those things, but you also need the people that are qualified to drive those trucks and deliver those things. So that's why I think this is so important is because we're seeing with soils that are healthier, we're seeing not as many nutrient deficiency issues, but traditional agronomy would tell you that the supply is too low, we should see problems, but we don't. And on the other side, we see soils where the supply is more than adequate, but yet we still have sulfur deficiency. We still have phosphorus deficiency. We can't get you know potassium into the plant or we can't do all these things. So that's why I think this is so important. It's, it's it, how can you better use the warehouse goods rather than just flooding the system over and over and over again? Yeah, I think that's a great point. It was one of the biggest, I mean, the biggest revelations for me working for biomakers is starting to look at all of these soils and seeing on your chemical fertility analysis that you don't have a deficiency in my macros or micros. Like you have all of the nutrients available to you in the soil, yet you're still diagnosing deficiencies in the tissue analysis later. And there's this gap in between. And that's what biomakers is really addressing is why is there a gap in what biological pathways are blocked? Uh, in order for us to leverage the nutrients that are already available to us. And that's what we're talking about here um, that Lance mentioning. We have to have the players in the game to get the nutrients or the ball moving. Um, so, you know, and this kind of gets right to it. We have looked at, when we talk about like the concept of soil health and what that means, um, you, the NRCS talks about it as the continued capacity for soil to function as a living ecosystem. And we've really looked heavily at the chemistry side of things from, you know, since the late 1800s, you know, chemical fertility analysis widely adopted in like the you know, mid 1900s. And that's how we've been looking at soils primarily is from a chemical lens. Um, and now we have the technology to look at it from a biological lens. So really, really important. The biology is what facilitates the biochemistry that is the nutrient cycles. You cannot have proper nutrient cycling without biology. And I think we've kind of forgotten that because we couldn't see it as easily. And now we have the, the technology to really dig in and, and see who's doing what and um, how efficient they are at it. Um, I did wanna loop in Gus here as well, who is our technical agronomist. And then I'd love Gus for you to jump in also if there's anything to um, to add to any of this, uh, Gus and I work really closely together. He's like my, you know, ride or die. I don't know what I would do without him. Um, so just want to introduce Gus really quick too, because again, I I just jump right into things and kind of forget about all of the the background uh, webinar pieces to this. So Gus, thank you for being here, and um, please jump in if there's anything anything to add on the technical side that I miss. Yeah, well, thank you, Marie, and you and Lance have covered everything perfectly that, you know, nothing else I would have added up until now. One thing that I like to mention when we talk a bit about just the concept of soil health and its definition, um, we often get very caught up focusing so heavily on the biological side, and um, it, I think it's important to step back and kind of look at the big picture when it comes to our whole soil system, not just looking at biology as some kind of silver bullet solution, because the biology does impact, we, we know for a fact it impacts 
the chemical fertility, the, the physical, the structure of the soil, and, and can, when optimized, improve those, those other facets of the soil. But as this Venn diagram indicates, there's also back and forth interactions. The chemical fertility, the pH level, organic matter, and, and the soil structure and texture can impact the biology as well. So with when it comes to talking soil health and really optimizing it, I think it's important to make sure that we, we don't lose sight of the chemical and, and physical aspects of the soil. And really the ultimate goal is to get them all working to complement each other, to, to optim the biology to optimize, you know, your chemical fertility to support um, plant uptake and assimilation of nutrients. And for those sides, the chemical and physical to complement the biological. And that's why in this Venn diagram, we have soil health kind of in the middle um, to really, as, as that second definition um, says, to op the optimum status of the soil's biological, physical, and chemical functions, which I, I believe was mentioned in an extension article by Dr. Mahdi El Kaisi of Iowa State University. Um, and, and these sort of, these, this Venn diagram just, you know, is, is not all encompassing. There's a lot of other factors that are kind of on the interface between biological and chemical, physical and chemical and, and biological and physical. Um, but really our, our goal is to look at the system holistically and ensure that we have these three different elements working in conjunction to support yield um, and, and optimal um, input efficiency. Yeah, Gus, that's a great point. And I think that, you know, really ties in why we love looking at the Haney and the bee crop test together is, you know, Haney does a really good job looking at the, the chemistry kind of with more of a biological lens, if you would. And, and then we also get the biological component. So um, I think that it's, it, it, that's why we're so excited about really putting those together. We've been doing that for a long time with Lance and partnership for the last few years is looking at um, the chemistry, the Haney test with the biological component and one really neat report. Um, and now Lance will just get to run, run them, run them himself in the lab and have all of it in house. Um, but we love looking at those things together. And I think this is a really good example as to why. And I could get stuck on that slide for a long time because there's so much to dive into, like how the pH can be buffered by biology, but the pH also impacts biology and all of these things are connected and then you can't look at any of them isolated from each other. Um, same with like soil structure, it's created by biology in a lot of ways, but if you take away the structure, then biology has a harder time thriving. So it just goes to the, the continuous nature of these systems and um, yeah, how, how critical it is to have some information in the transition to improving soil health. Um, so again, just to highlight really quickly, we're looking at soil biology in specific. Um, and this is kind of how we do it. So I wanted to get into the operational side so we can dive in and like understand, okay, how does this actually work? So from the soil to the bio data to those functional reports that Lance talked about, what we're doing is um, taking a soil sample in a very similar fashion that you take your fertility analysis. In fact, it's, it's the same protocol it's just that we need the soil right away, so it's in field condition. Um, but we're taking six to eight inch cores, composite samples throughout a management zone. We recommend zone sampling, looking at biology, grid sampling, I don't think makes sense um, financially or logistically, but for biology in specific, fertility is another story. But uh, so we're looking at zone sampling and within a management zone, composite samples, well mixed together, pull just a little bit. We don't need a lot for the biology portion. Um, if you're running chemical fertility in biology, then I think it comes out to about a cup and a half or two cups, right, Gus, that you need for both. Um, and then what we're doing on our side is similar to what they do on the chemical fertility side, except rather than extracting chemistry, like you do in a chemical fertility analysis, we're extracting DNA and extracting the biological component that is in the soil. And what we do with that information is that we take the DNA from the soil and we get this little vial that's just like copies of the DNA that we found of bacteria and fungi. And then we run that through a DNA sequencer. And then that tells us who's there, the relative abundance compared to the other microbes in the soil. And then, you know, so that's where we kind of get the bio data, and that's the raw data on the back end that we work with. And then we generate these functional reports that walk through all of the key components of soil functionality relative to agricultural production. So we look at the 
bio, uh, you know, the bio pathways for hormone production and stress adaptation and all of your macro and micronutrient pathways and pathogen pressure and resistance. Um, so we do identify pathogens as well. But we're looking at the whole system because you can't just, if you just look at whether or not a pathogen's there, you're not looking at the immune support that a plant has or the mineral availability that a plant has to have a strong immune system to ward off any disease that's present. So we're really looking at the whole picture. So again, hormone production, stress adaptation, macro and micronutrient pathways, and, and pathogen presence are the primary categories that we look at in our reports. Anything to add here? I just kind of want to talk operationally, like how we go from soil to these functional bio reports. Uh, just want to mention that the report is intended to be very easy to understand. Um, we, we don't, of course, expect everyone to be a microbiologist and make sense of a long list of of abstract species names. Um, so the functions on the report that Marie mentioned are laid out on a, on a, a simple to read um, scale, a, a five point scale from very low to very high. And I think that the only um, category of functionality that Marie didn't mention was biocontrol. So we look at, at, at species of beneficial bacteria and fungi that are known to suppress um, pathogens and, and certain insect pests, as well as nematodes in the soil. Um, because of course the level of Pathogen does make a difference in how likely a crop is to be impacted by a disease, but also the natural uh, biocontrol defenses there in the soil that that can help suppress certain uh, pests and pathogens also play a role. So like a lot of your trichoderma species known to be good biocontrol agents, so we, we measure that as well. Thanks for that addition, Gus. Lance, do you have something to add as well? Yeah, I just wanted to talk really briefly on the logistics side of it. So on the sampling part, if it's if, if it's my understanding, Yes, we need these soils to be somewhat, you know, sent off quickly, right? We don't need them to sit around on the dash here pickup uh, for two weeks, uh, you know, and that's true even of things that we do, Haney testing and some of those things are very, you know, more sensitive to those. So we recommend, and I believe that I, uh, this is also true for biomakers, is that those samples can be frozen uh, if they're going to be stored on site for for a while. Now. We don't necessarily, uh, talking with Alberto, we don't necessarily want to freeze thaw, freeze thaw, freeze thaw them all the time. But if you're going to store them uh, for a while, you can you can freeze them before shipping them to the lab. Uh, the other thing I'll mention is that if you're sending samples to us at Region Ag Lab, um, regardless if you're sending just for bee crop or if it's a combination of bee crop plus other tests that we run, you do not need to subsample in the field. Uh, you can simply collect a single soil bag like you would do for any other test. When you send those to the lab, we subsample those for you. Uh, we homogenize the sample. We do that work uh, in the laboratory. And that'll be true regardless of right now, because currently, of course, we're sending off a subsample to B-Crop, uh, to biomakers to, to perform their analysis. We're running the other things in house, but even when we are uh, doing this all internally at Regen, you do not need to subsample. So that's often a question I get about: Do we have to do them separate? And the answer is no. Yeah, that's a great point, and that, that's one of the things I love about the fact that they're the same sampling protocol, um, because you can do your chemical fertility analysis at the same time, and then you just send us one bag, and we can run both. It's amazing, um, yeah. rather than having to go out and pull samples separately with a different protocol. So. Um, yeah, again, we're going to talk about sampling protocol. I have it actually pulled up, so we'll go more in depth into yeah, how we should be doing that, but great call outs. Um, so yeah, you can keep it all, all together in one report. I think we might have dived into this a little bit more, but again, we're just looking at identifying the different biological pathways that are there and then delivering it in an all-in-one report, especially now that we have the Haney test you know, integrated. We've been doing that for a while, but the, the Haney test is, is in there. So you can look at both the biology and the chemistry in together in one report. And um, Wes alluded to this a little bit, but we have a portal. So in the report, you can look at high, things on a high level. You can get into our data portal and look at more granularity. There's a really cool little virtual microscope where you can identify the different species and their relative abundances shown on this little virtual microscope. So it's pretty cool to get in there and explore. Um, and play around with that as well. There's a lot of fun tools on there to explore the soil in different aspects. Um, one quick thing on that is that um, 
you mentioned integrating the Haney test into into the crop. So I just wanted to quickly touch on that. So yeah. that has already been done uh, for all of you listeners out there. So if you send a sample into Region Ag Lab and you want to run a Haney test and a bee crop test, the way that works right now is that you will still receive a Haney report from Region Ag Lab. Uh, that will be sent out to you as soon as it's done, which is, you know, typically that two day turnaround on, on Haney test. So, uh, we're not gonna, you know, have you wait for that report. Um, you're going to get that in, in real time. The, the, the data for that report are also sent currently to, to biomakers and will continue to be sent to them. Once the B crop portion is done, uh, then they will integrate that same information into their report. So you're, you're going to kind of get that information twice, but we don't want anybody to have to wait. We understand if you're trying to make fertility decisions, um, we, we know that those things happen kind of in real time. Uh, you know, a lot of times I've, I've got calls about where are my results and we haven't even received the samples yet. So we understand that you, you need to get those out and that'll continue to be the case. Uh, so I just wanted everybody to kind of know that as well. Yeah, that's another great call out. And, um, and we can, the, a lot of folks ask about turnaround time and like Lance mentioned, the Haney test, the turnaround time is much more is much quicker than the bee crop test. So coming from Lance's lab, you'll get those results right away. And then it'll take another few weeks for your biological results to be uploaded. And we'll talk about the, the timing yeah. as well here. Yeah, um, yeah. We do we're have gonna, a we're gonna Go ahead. I say, and and that's, that's currently, it takes a few weeks and Yep. Uh, I know we'll get into that later when we talk about what we're doing at Regen, but I think we can cut that down substantially. Yeah, cool. That's awesome. Um, so yeah, again, we talked about this is kind of one of the portals so you can compare a bunch of different fields and different metrics side by side and kind of look at where different fields lie, which is a really cool tool to, if you have areas where you're trying to diagnose yield deficiencies or uh, any type of issues, you can get in and look at if there's some trends going on amongst different fields. So I love that that tool in the in the portal as well. And so then we get into the testing and the actual, um, you know, the process of the bee crop tests themselves as the functional soil analysis. Um, this is a quick glance of the report. Uh, you can log into our website and request a report if you need to see what that looks like. Um, but what we're trying to really do is provide some metrics that'll help you analyze you know, opportunities for yield improvements or soil health improvements, excess increased nutrient cycling, monitor farm practices. So if you're trying to identify how tillage or different uh, inputs are affecting soil biology, you can look at that. And again, for disease risk, which we talked about a little as well. Um, I think we're, you know, again, covered some of this, but the, the goal here is to increase resilience. That's what I like to think about a lot, is really focusing on increasing resilience and understanding where we are biologically in addition to chemically and physically will help us really understand these things to minimize risk on our operation, optimize costs, and maximize our production. So looking at all these things together really comes down to resilience, and that's that can mean a lot of things, right? Like economic resilience, um production resilience and term you know being more resilient to risk um both economically and environmentally and so here's a little dive into the sampling instructions and i know i got some questions on timing um how to identify the samples uh different things like that so we can kind of stay here for a little bit dive into the sampling instructions dive into the sample timing and all these things that maybe gus lance and i can discuss some of these things for the audience together um, so the first step, first things first is selecting a parcel. Um, so we talked about this a little bit, but selecting a parcel, it should be the same crop, same management practices. Um, you don't want to do it immediately after a heavy rain, uh, but you know, any like average day in your area is a good day to collect samples. Um, and you, again, we're recommending zone sampling. So if you have one field, uh, that's under a pivot and you're re relatively homogeneous, then you could do one composite sample for that whole area. And what that looks like is pulling 10 cores or 15 cores, putting them in a bucket, mixing it up really well, and then pulling your subsample from there that you're going to send to us. Um, and like Lance mentioned, um, 
we do want the sample. We don't want it sitting in the dash for a long time. If you are pulling samples that day, it's best to overnight them to us or you know, send them to us right away, uh, three-day shipping um, that night or the next morning. If you can't do that or you're collecting samples for a few weeks at a time and you want to send them all at once, throw them in your freezer while you wait and then ship them to us on ice, ideally. Um, so that, that's a little bit about you know, submitting the sample, but selecting the parcel is really looking at management practices and uh, di big differences in soil type. So if you have you know, three very different characteristic zones in one field, um, then you would want to consider taking three samples in each zone. Maybe there's like a big dip in elevation where there's more water collecting in certain areas or very distinctly different soil types. Um, that you know is how we recommend selecting a parcel. For collecting a sample, again, it's very similar to your chemical fertility analysis. Uh, six inches relative depth is is kind of what we recommend um, for general row crops. It's a little bit different for fruit and vineyard crops, um, depending on how far down the root zones are. And, and yeah, again composite samples with a soil core, mixing it all together very well, and then pulling your one big sample from there. Um, this metadata piece is really, really important, critical to making sure that we analyze the sample properly and get you the information back so that you understand where it's from and what it, what you know, what you field it came from. Uh, like that. So a sample reference name that you're going to understand and identify the collection date is important. The crop type is important for us for running our algorithm because we want to compare your soil biology to other soils in that same cropping system. So the crop type is very important for us as well. Um, the parcel name, another unique identifier to you and your farm so that you know what sample correlated with what field. And then the parcel location, uh, which we can use to geomap uh, the different parcels in our database um, and in the portal. Uh, so you can identify and also look at a map to look at different categories on the map um, and in different fields. The, the submit your samples piece here again is, um, you know, we want a, you can use a tube or a sample bag, ideally a plastic Ziploc baggie. The thinner cardboard or paper bags don't hold the moisture and field temperature as much. So we really like our sample tubes and sample bags, but um, that's that's our preference. Um, again, you know, quick shipping, three-day shipping is great, room, te room temperature, um, or you can freeze the sample and ship it, to us, ship it to us on ice when it's ready to go. And then we have an app you can get on and log in. Your soil samples will be on that app, regardless of if they come through us or Region Ag Labs. And then um, right now, here's the, you know, this is Biomaker's uh, address, but of course, if you're submitting samples through Lance, you'll send them to Region Ag Labs for any of the other testing that you're doing as well. So we'll have one of these made up for Lance's lab in specific um, for Region Ag Labs, but this is just ours for biomakers. Um, anything to add here? There's a ton of questions, <laughs> so maybe we want to jump into Q and A sooner than later because um, I think that'll that'll offer some some often often. A, Awesome additions to the conversation. Anything to add here, guys? Um, yeah, the the only thing I was going to add is that um, you know we we have we receive soils in all kinds of different containers. Ziploc bags work fine for us. We get them all the time. We also have soil bags, and they're not. I mean, they're they're paper, but they're plastic lined okay. on the inside. Um, so you know, every lab kind of has something a little different. We have plastic lined paper bags, um, you know, that, that we're more than happy to provide you uh, from from the lab. Uh, we don't mind if those samples just go straight to biomakers. It's not a big deal. We receive samples from in bags from all over the place. Uh, but anyway, we have that. And then on the on point number three on the metadata piece, um, that's something that that Region Ag Lab is going to work closely with biomakers on to determine kind of the best way to capture that information. Uh, I just want to iterate how important that is uh, because the reports and the information, the interpretation depends on a lot of that metadata. 
and uh, receiving a box of soil samples with just your name on the box, it, it's believe it or not, we get that three or four times a week uh, at the lab. And it is, it is just a logistics nightmare to go back and try to track down all that information. However, we wanna streamline that process for you as a grower. Um, we wanna be able to reduce human error. So we wanna be able to capture that information because we have to pass that on to biomakers in order to generate these reports. Uh, so anyway, just wanted to emphasize how important that is. Yeah, and we cannot emphasize this enough. It's really hard for us to do anything with the soil samples if we don't know where it came from, what field it's assigned to, and we can't give you information that you'll actually know anything what to do with. If it doesn't have your parcel name and sample uh, some sort of sample reference attached. Um, and for us, the crop is also very important because that is part of the algorithm. So again, yes, just to reiterate, super important to have that metadata. And I actually pulled up our sample submission sheet just so you can kind of see what it looks like. And this may look different um, for on Lance's side, but it should have all really similar information, right? So really critical to have your information, email required. Um, this is how we will create an account for you in the portal is with your information. Um, and grower information, if you're an agronomist or a consultant, is also really helpful to help keep you keep that organized for you in the portal. And then the vial ID is what we will assign once it comes into the lab or a sample code. Uh, your field ID and reference is really, really important. So this is like your unique field identifier. And then if there's another sample reference name um, attached to that that you want to mention. So let's say you're in field A and you're looking at something specific. So, um, you know, you're identifying a good area versus a bad area, for example. You really want to have that, that reference point for you to understand in that field what you're looking at. And then the crop type, the collection date, latitude, longitude to make a geo reference. And then if there is additional information like soil type, irrigation usage, if you're using organic practices or different soil health practices, we can add that as well. But this is, you know, an example of what the soil sample submission sheet looks like today and how that might look moving forward as well. Um, these are some of the different factors that we're looking at, but I think I want to just hop into questions here because I think we talked about this all enough. Yeah, here we go. Um, so I think I'm going to go straight to the audience questions and we might cover a lot of these, but we might also get to the audience questions. Um, you know, gone through as well. So, um, let's see. What is required to start B crop test service? A B crop advisor based in South Africa. I need an ID and get a local lab. Um, for international sampling, we'll, we've got your contact info. We'll reach out and we can talk about how to um, make sure that we have permits to get samples from South Africa into the United States. Um, I think we've got most of the the world covered, so we'll get to that, but um, we'll make a note to reach out to you. Um, how do you extrapolate the results from a sample of a few grams of soil to productive acres? So we talked about this a little bit, but that's why composite sampling is so important. So we're taking multiple cores throughout an entire zone to get a good representation of the biological activity so we can understand the, the relative functionality of that soil biology across the whole management zone. Um, anything to add there? I'm just going to try to fly through some of these I can answer quickly so because there's a uh, lot of them. All, all I was going to say is that look, that's been a challenge of soil science since the dawn of soil science, right? Um, it's also just a challenge of science in general. Right? That's why so many people always say, well, the, the answer is we don't know. It's inconclusive. We need to collect more data. Well, we can continue to do that forever. And so we can't sample every square inch of soil to a depth of six inches across an entire acre, let alone an entire field. And so um, you are correct. I mean, it, it, it is the, our best guess, but there, I say that with pride in saying that, well, you're not just measuring pH and then trying to guess about all these other metrics. I mean, this is a, there is a lot of data points being collected here, even though, Yes, the representation may not be ideal, but in, until we can literally run metagenomics across every square inch of soil across an acre, I mean, this is this is kind of where we're at. Now, the way that I like to think about this, similar to the soil carbon conversation, is 
how much more are you going to spend to get the level of detailed granularity on exactness and is that going to pay off so if you can if you can look at a soil with 85 percent certainty and say that this is the relative functionality we have a directional recommendation of where we should head whether we need more or less and what functionalities there are or am i going to pay an extra you know 120 percent or 200 percent to get that extra 15 percent certainty or five percent certainty at a you know exponential cost so um that's the way that i think about it we're looking at trends in relative functionality so that we can make directional decisions in our practices and we have found that as you compile more samples, more subsamples into an individual sample, the representation of that sample does seem to, to go up. You know, that's really, as Lance and Marie said, the best way to ensure that we at least account for some of that variability that is, is an issue with any sort of soil tests. That's also one of the important reasons why we need the crop type for each sample, because for, for some crop types, we actually analyze them relative to only those, those crop samples in our database. Um, because of course, you know, like your legumes, your soybeans have root nodules and then certain crops are based on differences in root physiology are going to select for different microorganisms than other crops. So um, that crop type does also kind of help us cut down on variability a little bit um, and, and generate metrics that are, are more isolated and focused on what specific cropping system we're evaluating. Yeah, cool. Thanks for adding that, Gus. Um, so a couple more questions on here about that could that line up with what's on our Q and A already. So let's talk about some of those. Um, how does the B crop test compare to the Haney test, and what is the the cost to add on the soil biology test? So Lance, do you want to? I can jump in too, but do you want to kind of take the first stab at how the B crop and Haney test work together, and uh, yeah. we can talk about cost together? Yeah, certainly. Um, yeah, I'll just I'll jump in on the back end of that really quick cost um, so the Haney test the Haney test is $55 a sample um, and the B crop test currently is a 199 a sample so we are regenerating lab when I say we we are simply offering the B crop service for the same price that you would get with biomakers uh, we're not upcharging this we're not doing anything different um, we really are working in a partnership or an extension of their service through a different lab um, so the cost is just that it's 55 plus 199. Um, if you're going to run both of those together, how do they complement each other? So the Haney test is of course, evaluating nutrient supply, right? So it's looking at, at fertility, um, using a biological extractant. That's really the difference between Haney and all the other conventional, I say conventional traditional soil tests. The Haney test also includes some biological measures, uh, but they are very, uh, I guess, kind of pie in the sky, like large picture concepts, right? So soil respiration is, a, is an indicator of biological uh, life. Um, we're also going to look at water soluble carbon and things like that as a driver for biology, as a food supply. But the Haney test does not dive into the details of who those players are uh, how many of them are there? What balance are they in? What functionalities do they carry out, right? Uh, so I always say the Haney test is like counting the number of people in a room. It doesn't tell you anything about who they are, what they do, are they active, crying, sleeping, what? Um, the B crop test then complements that and says, okay, well, based on some of these metrics now, who are these players? And that's not even really that important unless you know what they're doing. Right. So I think Gus kind of alluded to that. Like you want it, you want nine pages of Latin species names spit out at you. That's fine. I mean, if you really want to know, but that's not overly what's important uh, from an agronomic standpoint, is we want to know which one of those, which of those organisms are potentially causing disease or which of those organisms are helping promote healthy root production through hormones, uh, which of those organisms are supplying sulfur. So that's how the two of these things really kind of come together because is it a supply issue? And sometimes it is, you know, sometimes it is. I, I mean, I've, I've simply told people like, look, your pH is 5.2. We need to address that because it's a hindrance on all these other biological processes or your phosphorus, extractable phosphorus is less than one parts per million. We need phosphorus. 
you know, in the system. So sometimes it is, and that's what the Haney test still gives us. It gives us an insight into those more traditional agronomy type problems that may exist um, beyond just looking at, at just the microbiome and wondering, well, this doesn't look very good. We don't know why. Um, so the, the Haney test tries to offer a little more of the why. Yeah, I think that's a great point. And, and again, Gus also talked about this, but like, it's very important that like you can't, you know, sometimes people talk about like, well, you can just look at the biology. It's like, no, no, no. You have to look at all of it together. Now we just have the biological component. So when we understand if we truly do have a soil deficiency in chemicals in our fertility, or do we have a biological deficiency? And how are they interacting? And so, like like Lance mentioned, we can have true mineral deficiencies or nutrient deficiencies, or we could just have biological deficiencies or both. But uh, we, you know, looking at them together is really powerful in our management decision or decision making. Um, just looking at here at some of the other questions. Do, do, do. There's a lot of them. Um, one of the questions was sample timing. So when is the best time to pull the sample? Uh, there's a lot of ways we could answer this question. I like to answer it that it's like based on um, operations and logistics for you in the field, right? So if you're pulling a Haney test in the fall or in the spring, and that's when you always do your chemical fertility analysis, and you can do it at the, do the biology portion at the same time, then I would recommend doing it at the same time. Uh, biology is going to change throughout the whole season, just like your nutrient uptake and nutrient availability changes throughout the whole season. We know that. However, you know, again, it comes down to this question of like, for a 5% more certainty, are you going to go and like pull another batch of samples, send them in and like do the whole thing over again, just for, you know, a, a small increase in, in accuracy. Um, so I think doing that at the same time that you're pulling your Haney test is what makes the most sense operationally. We get great insights. Um, another question that was on here that came up relative to that is, are we looking at active or interactive microbes? Um, we are looking at all of the microbes that are present. So typically we're looking at, uh, biology can go dormant. So if you pull biology, you know, samples in the winter or in the fall and the biology is dormant, we're still identifying it. If the, if the microbes actually die, they get consumed rather quickly in the soil. So we don't identify a ton of dead organisms. We're identifying dormant or inactive in addition to living and active microbes, if that makes sense. So anything that's, anything that's dead and no longer functioning will cycle through the soil biology really quickly and will be identifiable within a few days. Right. So. And I would just add that a majority of the biology in the soil is dormant. It's not active. Um, biology, the, the microorganisms have this uncanny ability to sit and wait. They are incredibly patient. Uh, so a lot of times, you know, conditions aren't necessarily optimal for them to be active. So you might have, that's where we are looking at basal metabolic rates. So the basal metabolic rate of your soil, right, is just the average across day to day to day. And, and that is really a field measurement um, versus the optimal time. And the idea is that if everything's in, in place, the wonderful thing is they can get a lot done and a lot accomplished when those times are there. And the plant is helping support those conditions to make them act. So uh, all of that plays into a role. And it's also to kind of step back to what Mary said, consistency in sampling is key. Uh, and so I always tell producers like, look, if you want to sample in the spring, fine, sample in the spring. If you want to sample in the fall, sample in the fall. If you want to sample in July in the middle of a cornfield, go for it. Um, but you don't want to be pulling samples in April. And this is true just even for the Haney testing. Pull samples in April and compare that to something you pulled in October unless your goal is to understand how things are different in April and October after a growing season. If that's your goal, then that's exactly how you would sample it. If you're just trying to track change over time, year to year to look at progress in your movement. Are you building a biological system? Are you adding food into the system? Are you balancing a seed-in ratio? If that's what your goal is, then we want to just be consistent. 
Yeah, that's a great point. I mean, being able to compare these things side by side year after year is what becomes very powerful also. Uh, and in our portal, you can actually do that and look at your samples side by side year after year to see if you're making improvements in certain areas where you have deficiencies today. Um, so doing it at the same time of the year and just being able to compare them side by side with the same lab and the, the same timing, that's you know when you can start to make some really cool comparisons year after year as, as you're shifting and changing your practices. Um, a couple other quick questions here. Uh, th so there's a couple of questions on like international sampling. We collect samples from all over the world. Lance does too. So we'll you know we can coordinate. We get samples from Canada, Africa, Australia, New Zealand, Europe, all over the place. And I know Lance, you've talked about getting samples from all over the world also. So we mm -hmm. both have experience getting samples from all over the place. So it, you know if you're asking about sampling coming from you know outside of the U.S. We've got permits and things to do that. We've done that a lot. Both of us, Regen Ag Labs and Biomakers have, so um, that is no problem. Um, let's see what other questions are here for us. We've got about five minutes or so. Um, turnaround time, let's talk about that. Um, so Lance mentioned the Haney test they can deliver within a couple of days. Uh, the DNA sequencing is a much longer process, and so it takes longer. Right now, we we say around a four to six week turnaround time for the biological compor component. Average is three weeks. Um, Lance has some really cool ideas how to make that even more efficient, but it's in, operationally, as the technology stands today, it'll never be less than two weeks right now. Um, so plan for four to six weeks. I think that that's a good like just plan for that so that you're you know if you are wanting to use the information for management decisions in the springtime pull it, if you're pulling samples in the fall great or early spring so that you have enough time to get that information and incorporate into your management plans um that's where we stand today and i know lance mentioned if you have the haney test um then you can get that turned around before the b crop test comes back which is awesome so Lance, anything to, to add there? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I visited the, the facility in California. I watched the process. Um, and I, you know, one of the biggest hindrances right now or, or kind of bottlenecks is that the, the sequencer, uh, you know, first of all, if you're gonna run the sequencer, uh, it's gonna take the exact same amount of time regardless if there's two samples on it or 60. So it, it holds 60 samples. So one of the issues is filling up runs uh, because when you start the sequencer, you can't just start it for two samples and expect to turn them around the next day. The sequencer also runs, if I'm not totally mistaken, about 56 hours. So once you hit start, the sequencer runs for 56 hours. Um, the goal at Reach and Ag Lab, we are setting up a complete dedicated biomakers bee crop lab uh, within our facility. Uh, we are going to be doing extractions in in real time uh so as we're receiving samples we're going to be doing the extractions um and we are going to be uh running the sequencer as soon as it's full and we're going to try to work very closely with biomakers to pass samples back and forth as needed to ensure that our sequencer is running uh in other words it is going to be running uh, in addition, I, you know, we are in the process, I'll just say this, we're in the process of an expansion project, uh, adding on a lot of square feet to our facility. Um, within that, we are building a dedicated 1,800 square foot bee crop lab. Uh, from our calculations, looking at the footprint, we theoretically have enough space there and staffing capability to process over 50,000 of these a year uh you know so that's the kind of scale we're going to but if that's the case we're not going to be waiting you know we're not going to be waiting to start running stuff right um we're going to do this in real time and i'm really hopeful that when we start getting that type of vol not 50,000, but when we start getting more volume in for this we're going to be able to turn these around in a week that is our goal at, at region is a week um, and again, if, if the sequencer technology gets better and faster, that'll probably be even better. Uh, to be safe, I'm not going to tell you the day one you send us a sample and we're going to turn around in a week. 
okay, in April. Um, by next fall, if we've got enough interest in this and we're seeing that and we're seeing the value and I think other people are too, we have a, a constant stream of samples coming in. There's gonna be a constant stream of data going out. Uh, that's really, really our goal with this. Um, we understand that turnaround time is, is one of the big three factors that always plays a role in, in soil testing on a commercial side, so. Yeah, totally. And, and I think, you know, just to kind of wrap things up here, and one of the reasons we were so excited to work with Lance is, like our lab is is running at capacity right now. So having extra capacity in a lab that specializes in soil health, which is you know, really in line with our mission, um, in addition to the years that Lance has creating efficiencies in lab operations, um, I think we're really excited to to learn from what you what you can accomplish at Region Ag Labs um, and uh, yeah, just bring, bring all those pieces together. So. Um, Right now, plan for four to six weeks. Once Lance get every, gets everything up and running in April, which is maybe another important timeline to highlight, is that um, we will be doing all of the training and equipment installation this winter. And our goal is to have samples running through Regen April 1st. Um, so that's just a little bit on timeline. But uh, yeah, I would plan for four to six weeks this, this fall and spring and then and see what we can optimize from there. Um, I know Mary, I know, yeah. I was really quick. I know there's a lot of questions we probably aren't able to get to during this. So um, if you don't mind, please collect those questions. And I okay. think that maybe we can work, uh, Gus, Mary, you and I, we can uh, work on getting answers and then maybe send that answer list back out to the attendees. Um, you know, it wouldn't be fair to not address some of those if we can. Yeah, totally. So typically, wrapping up webinars, just so you guys all know, um, we'll have, we'll download the list of questions. All of us will handle answering all of those questions, make sure that we get back to you and then send like an F, a Q and A um, in the follow-up with the recording of the webinar. So we've got that system. It's easy for us to download, download all of the questions and we'll make sure that if we weren't able to get to you today, uh, that we will get back to you with all of these really specific, awesome nitty gritty questions that we got on here. Um, I think we covered most of the big picture ones. There's some specifics about um different diseases uh which we can we can get back to you on all of those specific questions um any other high level stuff to add before we log off here it's great to spend spend the hour just diving into some of these these logistics and details um anything that sort of lance that you want to add in our last minute together. Yeah, one thing I wanted to make sure I mentioned is that um, we're, you know, we we have an agronomy team, including myself, who are responsible for helping interpret these reports, um, answering any technical questions, anything on, you know, whether when it comes to soil biology, it's it's kind of a big can of worms. A lot of uh, it, it gets to be a lot of information really quickly. Um, so we're always available to help walk through reports, help go over the data analysis tools on the portal, and just help ensure that you get as much practical data as possible out of your beet crop reports. Um, whether you know the samples are coming through Regen or directly to our lab, um, we're always available to set up a call and, and go over the, the reports. Um, the same way that Lance and, and his team at Regen are, are happy to get on the phone to walk through a Haney report. Um, and you know, as as our uh, partnership develops, you know, we'll we'll be looking at more ways to integrate the the bee crop results and the Haney tests and look at patterns and trends. Um, but if any any technical questions come up in interpreting results, we're always happy to help out. Yeah, and just want to plug there too in this last minute that um, we do have both of us have teams to help answer some of those questions, and we have a lot of great online resources uh, that I highly suggest. So our bee crop advisor program is a 90 minute training. It comes with CEU credits if you're a crop advisor. Um, or a PCA, it's great to um, just kind of get the biological lens and learn more about our technology and interpreting the reports. Uh, some of our webinar webinars are also that way. So highly encourage uh, the self-education piece and understanding. And um, we will also be creating online resources collectively with Lance to, um, you know, Gus, you know, our team's always welcome, but there's also a small handful of us and there's going to be hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of growers and reports. So wanting to also set realistic expectations to be available for you and to answer all of your questions and 
um, there's going to be a lot of opportunities to learn and educate yourselves as well. And ultimately, your thinking cap on the farm is the most powerful thing to help interpret these results. Um, so just want to keep that in mind and empower you with that, as much information and education as, as possible to understand these things and to make management decisions with them. Amazing. I think that's a wrap. We will get back to you on some of those additional questions that we didn't get to today, but I think that was a great Q&A. We got through a lot of it and I really appreciate you being here. And we're really excited to just deepen our partnership with Lance at Region Ag Labs. I know I'm really excited and um, looking forward to it. So thanks for spending the time with us, Gus. Thanks for being here and uh, Lance, appreciate your time and thanks everybody on the webinar for joining us. Yeah, thank you everybody. Yep. Great, and thank you, thank you everyone for joining us. Yeah.